right now, you know, the average, you know, art history student or something probably isn't going to, you know, they're not probably, they don't think they know about programming and things like this. But by the time it really becomes a kind of purely, you know, you just walk up to it, there's no documentation, you start just typing, you know, compare these pictures with these pictures and, you know, see the use of this color, whatever, and you generate this piece of of computational language code that gets run, you see the result, you say, oh, that looks roughly right, or you say, that's crazy. Um, and maybe then you eventually get to say, well, I better actually try and understand what this computational language code did. Um, and, and that becomes a thing that you learn, just like, it's kind of an interesting thing because unlike with mathematics, where you kind of have to learn it before you can use it, this is a case where you can use it before you have to learn it. Well, I got a sad possibility here, or maybe exciting possibility, that very quickly people won't even look at the computational language. They'll trust that it's generated correctly as you get better and better at generating that language. Uh, yes, I think that there will be enough cases where people see, you know, because you can make it generate tests too. Yes. And and so you'll say, um, we've, we're doing that. I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool thing, actually. Yes. Because you, you, you know, say this is the code, and you know, here are a bunch of examples of running the code. Yeah. Okay, people will at least look at those, and they'll say that example is wrong, and you know, then it'll kind of wind back from there. And I agree that that the the kind of the intermediate level of people reading the computational language code, in some cases people will do that. In other cases, people just look at the tests, and or even just look at the results. And sometimes it'll be obvious that you got the thing you wanted to get because you were just describing, you know make me this interface that has two sliders here. And mm -hmm. you can see it has that those two sliders there. And that's that's kind of that's that's the result you want. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, one of the questions then is in that setting where, you know, you have this kind of ability, broad ability of people to access computation, what should people learn? You know, in other words, right now you, you know, you go to computer science school, so to speak, and a large part of what people end up learning, I mean, it's been a funny historical development because back you know, 30, 40 years ago, computer science departments were quite small mm -hmm. and they taught, you know, things like finite automata theory and compiler theory and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a company like mine rarely hired people who'd come out of those programs because the stuff they knew was, well, I think it's very interesting. I love that mm -hmm. theoretical stuff. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't that useful for the things we actually had to build in software engineering. And then kind of there was this big pivot in the, in the 90s, I guess, Mm -hmm. where you know, there was a big demand for sort of IT type programming and so on and software engineering and then you know big demand from students and so on you know we want to learn this stuff and uh, and 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 I think you know the thing that really was happening in part was lots of different fields of human endeavor were becoming computational mm -hmm. you know for all x there was a there was a computational x mm -hmm. and this is a um, uh, and that was the thing that um, the people were responding to um and but then kind of this idea emerged that to get to that point, the main thing you had to do was to learn this kind of trade or, or, or skill of doing, you know, programming language type programming. Mm -hmm. and, and that, uh, you know, it, it kind of is a strange thing, actually, because I, you know, I remember back when I used to be in the professoring business, which is now 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, gosh, that's a rather long time, time ago. Flies, the, um, you know, it was, it was right when, they were just starting to emerge kind of computer science departments at sort of uh, 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 fancy research universities and so on. I mean, some had already had it, but the, the other ones yep. that, that um, were just starting to have that. And it was kind of a, a, a thing where they were kind of wondering, are we going to put this thing that is essentially a, a trade-like skill, are we going to somehow attach this to the rest of what we're doing? And a lot of these kind of knowledge work type activities have always seemed like things where that's where the humans have to go to school and learn all this stuff, and that's never going to be automated. Yeah. And, you know, this is, it's kind of shocking that rather quickly, you know, a lot of that stuff is clearly automatable. Yeah. And I think, you know, but the question then is, okay, so if it isn't worth learning kind of, uh, you know, how to do car mechanics, you only need to know how to drive the car, so to speak, mm -hmm. what do you need to learn? And, you know, in other words, if you don't need to know the mechanics of how to tell the computer in detail, you know, make this loop, 
you know, set this variable, uh, you know, set up this array, whatever else. If you don't have to learn that stuff, you don't have to learn the kind of under the hood things, what do you have to learn? I think the answer is you need to have an idea where you want to drive the car. In other words, you need to have some notion of, you know, your, you know, you need to have some picture of sort of what the what the architecture of what is computationally possible is. Well, there's also this kind of artistic element of um, of conversation because you ultimately you use natural language to control the car. So it's not just the, the where you want to go. Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's a question of who's going to be a great prompt engineer. Yeah. Okay. So my current theory this week, good expository writers are good prompt engineers. What's an expository writer? So like a... Somebody who can explain stuff well. Huh. But which department does that come from? In the university? Yeah. I have no idea. I think they killed off all the expository writing departments. Well, there you go. Strong words with Stephen Wolfram. Well, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure if that's right. I mean, I, I, am, I, I right. actually am curious because, in fact, I just sort of initiated this kind of study of of what's happened to different fields at universities. Because, like, you know, there used to be geography departments at all yeah. universities, and then they disappeared. Actually, right before GIS became common, I think they hmm. disappeared. You know, linguistics departments came and went in many universities. And it's kind of interesting because these things that people have thought were worth learning at one time and then they kind of die off. And then, you know, I do think that it's kind of interesting that for me, writing prompts, for example, I realize, you know, I, I think I'm an okay expository writer. And mm -hmm. I realize when I'm sloppy writing a prompt and I don't really think, because I'm thinking it's, I'm just talking to an AI. I don't yeah. need to, you know, try and be clear in explaining things. That's when it gets totally confused. And I mean, in some sense, you have been writing prompts for a long time with Wolfram Alpha, thinking about this kind of stuff. Yeah, how to convert natural language into computation? Well, right, but that's a you know the one thing that I'm wondering about is, uh, you know, it is remarkable the extent to which you can address an LLM like you can address a human, so to speak, and and I think that is because it it you know it learnt from all of us humans. It's it's uh, the reason that it responds to the ways that we will explain things to humans is because. It is a representation of how humans talk about things. But it is bizarre to me, some of the things that kind of are uh, sort of expository mechanisms that I've learned in trying to write clear, you know, expositions in English that, uh, you know, just for humans, that those same mechanisms seem to also be useful for, for, for the LLM. But on top of that, What's useful is the kind of mechanisms that maybe a psychotherapist employs, which is a kind of uh, like almost manipulative or game theoretic interaction, where maybe you would do with a friend, like a thought experiment that if this was the last day you were to live, or yeah. if, if I ask you this question and you answer wrong, I will kill you. Those kinds of problems seem to also help. Yes. In interesting ways. Yes. So it ma makes you wonder, like the way a therapist, I think, would like a good therapist, probably you know, we create layers in our human mind to between like uh, between between the outside world and what is true, what is true to us, and um, maybe about trauma and all those kinds of things. So if projecting that into an LLM, maybe there might be a deep truth that it's concealing from you. It's not aware of it. That you, to get to that truth, you have to kind of really kind of manipulate the thing. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like these jailbreaking, jailbreaking. things for, for, for LLMs. And, but the space of jailbreaking techniques, as opposed to being fun little hacks, that could be an entire system. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 just think about the computer security aspects of, of how you, you know, phishing and, and computer security, you know, phishing of humans yeah. and phishing of LLMs, LLMs. Is, is a... Is that they're very similar kinds of things, but I think I mean this this um, uh, you know this whole thing about kind of the AI wranglers, AI psychologists, all that stuff will come. Yeah. The thing that I'm curious about is right now the things that are sort of prompt hacks mm -hmm. are quite human. They're quite sort of psychological human kinds of hacks. The thing I do wonder about is if we understood more about kind of uh, the science of the LLM. Will there be some totally bizarre hack that is, you know, like repeat a word three times and put a this, that, and the other there that somehow plugs into some aspect of how the LLM works? Um, that is not, you know, that, that's kind of like 
like an optical illusion for humans, for yes. example, like one of these mind hacks for humans. What are the mind hacks for the LLMs? I don't think we know that yet. And that becomes a kind of us figuring out, reverse engineering the language that controls the LLMs. And the thing is, the reverse engineering can be done by a very large percentage of the population now because it's natural language interface. Right. It's kind of interesting to see that you were there at the birth of the computer science department as a thing, and you might be there at the death of the computer science department <laughs> as a thing. Well, yeah, I don't know. There were computer science departments that existed uh, earlier, but the ones, the, the broadening of, of every university had to have a computer science department. Yes, I was, I was, uh, I watched that, so to speak.